everyone. My name is Marco Zennaro, and I'm really glad to welcome you to this first Open Science Seminar of 2022, organized by the Science, Technology, and Innovation Unit of ICTP and ICTP Library. So thank you, Eva, for being here and for co-organizing this, this seminar. So you might remember that last year, in 2021, we had Anna Persic from UNESCO presenting about the Open Science Recommendation of UNESCO. And we learned at the time that the next phase would be making it operational. So it's good to have a recommendation. And the second phase is to make it a reality. So I'm really glad to have today Davide Poletto and his colleagues uh, presenting the uh, Reliance project, which is in the framework of the European Open Science Cloud, which again is about making the UNESCO recommendation on open science operational. So we're going to learn about digital assets for sustainable development. And we're going to learn about, you know, scientists' practical experiences. Just a few words about Davide. So Davide holds a European doctorate in sustainable development, governance affairs from the Kafoska University in Venice. He has been collaborating with a different national and international institutions and organization. He served UNESCO for 12 years in the Venice office as a consultant program and project officer in science, focusing especially on scientific collaboration in Europe and Southeast Europe. He has been promoter of many innovative training and activities in different fields, ranging from DRM to uh, sustainable energy, open science, and so on. And now he serves as an international consultant and as an active environmental campaigner. And he's giving this talk as part of a team of the Horizon 2020 Reliance Project under Alpha Consult UK. And we're going to learn about the Alliance project from, from David and from his colleagues as well. So David, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marco. I thank you every, everybody here in, uh, online for having taken an hour, an hour of their time, of your time, of their schedule to be with us today. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, uh, we're here today to see also from the title to come up with uh, some uh, tangible and practical tools um, we call digital assets. They are the fruit of uh, a work of, uh, in particular, this European project called Reliance, but in reality is embedded in a, in a bigger ecosystem. So if you allow me to introduce very briefly the, the, the program today, we would like to achieve with this. Um, so I'm going to introduce about five minutes, uh, the so-called possible interrelationship that we might have <clears throat> between the open science cloud and the digital asset embedded into into it with the UNESCO and ICP, ICTP recommendation and strategy for open science. The introduction to Reliance services that's been done, that will be done by Raul Palma is the coordinator of Reliance project. So pleasure to be, to be with us today. And, and Reliance services in use. So we will showcase how Reliance services can work and can serve the purpose of science and scientists at the daily work. And, and here we have a, a uh, research scientist from the University of Norway, Anne Folieu, who will introduce us how she worked with this and she, show, she will showcase it. Then we have some time for question and answer, of course, and then I will finish the presentation with something that can be very, I would say, very concrete, very tangible way of starting cooperation using these assets. It's a sort of a reliance challenge. It's not challenge for competition, but it's a challenge for cooperation and bringing together different researchers and educators, scientists, also practitioners of certain disciplines, they find in the open science, their conducive environment to, to create, uh, to do research and share data, generate data together. And the working of, uh, I would say, very important and challenging dimension of our times is like, uh, you know, on topping impact of water, geohazard disaster risk management, and also some special features on COVID-2020 lockdowns and the relationship with our Earth system biosphere. And then it will be time of 10 minutes for final question and answer. But anyway, we'll be linked somehow with Marco. So um, this will be recorded. And whenever you might have any kind of interest toward us, please don't hesitate to contact us. Okay, 
So let's start then. Um, so Reliance is a small project. It's a couple of millions of euros. So it's not we're going to reshape the world as it is with this. But the very important thing is that Reliance is a part of a family. So uh, the family is called Infrail 7. It's a cluster of project that has been somehow uh, uh, put in place with the aim of building up and strengthen the infrastructure of the European Open Science Cloud. So they have a common, a common goal together. Of course, they do different things, and, uh, but they are complementary in, uh, in the world. So what has been very uh, smart to do, and, uh, and we are working on it, uh, we already set a collaborative agreement, a sort of memorandum of cooperation among this project. So it's actually, we are like a federated. We also set out arrangements to work together, like uh, for instance, the first project collaboration board, and which take care and carry out all the activities. Sorry, I have, uh, if you found, <laughs> I have uh, some boats passing by, I'm in Venice, <laughs> it's just a peculiarity. Sometimes boat passing by. Um, and basically we have a cross-project collaboration board and this carry out main activities, uh, intra-project activities related to the techni technical aspects, but also <coughs> the uptake and trainings. So they will be part of, uh, I would say, joint uh, capacity building exercise we're going to set in place. One of, our, of the most important of the infra ELSC digital assets uh, capacity building is that of Reliance. And actually, I'm, I'm in charge of the work task that's called epistemic communities engagement and capacity building. That is a, a, exactly what we're supposed to do in the next uh, months up to December. But then we will we will roll out this later on. The other thing is that Reliance, besides being part of this uh, Infraels family, uh, this also includes another big project of 40 million euros called uh, Else Future, and uh, is also part of the ILSC and. Uh, I'm not going to explain you what ESC is, is a, a, but anyway, is the environment in which we are embedded. And just to give you uh, an image, a simplified image of what it means to be part of this uh, ecosystem. And, um, and anyway, we, we are here to work in a very, uh, we say, cooperative fashion. Uh, okay, whatever we do, whatever we produce as a, as a, as a scope, and the scope is to empower, to strengthen, to reinforce, the overall ESCO infra, ESCO infrastructure with different digital assets. And, 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 and this is uh, also the most important aspect of our work, that whatever we do in the frame of this project, we're not, uh, we say, uh, we're not full apart when the project will end. We know that 90% of what we do when we work in this uh, external, you know, uh, founded project, and most of the problem is the sustainability after, so the legacy after the project. And the legacy stay with EOS because whatever we do will be serve the purpose of researchers after that, after the end of Reliance. That will not last that long because a couple of years maybe will be extended for other six, additional six. But what we want to leave behind us is something that can endure, can last, and can be at the service of our research communities and educators who ever want to uh, approach it. Um, so, what, what is the relationship between uh, the EOSCO, Infra EOSCO, SCTV, and UNESCO? Well, actually, if we read through the uh, different body policy document uh, recommendation and strategy of open science, including the last one in November 20, 2021, then you just see that the, what we are doing every day by developing this infrastructure and, and trying also to, uh, uh, I would say, um, to lure researchers and, and to uptake what we're doing in terms of digital assets is as likely it meets exactly the, the, the scope uh, in, uh, and the, 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 the object of the of, um, of UNESCO recommendation of open science. And, uh, and it, it can be applied in terms of sustainability because most of what we do and the test bed for our digital assets are environmental problem or social environmental change phenomena like climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, uh, uh, marine pollution, Geohazard. So we really look at what has the most relevant aspect of our nowadays life and challenges. And through our through our uh, in you know digital assets, we also uh, build uh, uh, inclusiveness and scientific cooperation. So these are not exclusive tools. These are inclusive tools that everybody, <clears throat> although they are branded Europe, okay, but are not made just for Europeans. And this is the other point we have to. To consider that whatever we produce 
in the frame of this project, in, in the frame of a larger project that in Creos environment I mentioned before, it's for everybody. And, and then, and this everybody also get empowered by our digital assets, their capacity to empower the infrastructure. And this is actually, I think what uh, is being told in the 2020-2024 strategy wise CTP. So uh, by having somehow experience with UNESCO, as Margaret said before, 12 years of work and service for the organization science, and by having the opportunity now to work with different team and in, at the European level, I think there's a lot of entry point, a potential entry point, and some of them have been already somewhat tested. We already organized a brainstorming meeting, uh, showing off a bit, uh, showcasing our, our solution, our services to the University of Rwanda. And that was very interesting. And thank you, Marco, for bonding us with us, with them. So um, in order to summarize what I say um, with uh, words of no mind, of course, but to the founding director of Abdul Salam, one say that the science is a common heritage of all humankind. And, uh, and then we think the ILSC is a science common that contribute building that heritage. And the InfraEOSC and Reliance project is, brings new work in tools for it. So um, this is the concept we'd like to, to close this first introductory part of what, uh, what Reliance for and uh, is there for you too. So thank you very much. And I will leave the floor to my colleague, Rob Palma, the coordinator of Reliance project. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, Davide, for, for the words and for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is uh, Raul Palma. I am the coordinator of the Reliance project, as it was mentioned. I am affiliated to the Poznan Supercomputing and Networking Center in Poland, as this is one of the biggest uh, research institutes in, in, in the country. And we run, of course, one of the largest e infrastructures as well in, in Poland. Uh, so, as uh, Davide was saying at the beginning, um, Reliance is uh, basically one of the uh, infra 07 projects. Each of them were targeting different points. In our case, in Reliance, our goal was to extend the research in every capabilities of the EOSC with a set of connecting services, interconnected services that would allow the researchers to adopt fair and open science principle. So that, that's our main goal here. Uh, so if you go next, uh, Davide, please. <clears throat> so in order to, to give you a bit more on, on, on that and before introducing the services themselves, let me just give you a brief introduction to our vision or why we came up with these ideas. So and this goes back to the pro problem of the research life cycle. So of course, um, about a very, very high level, we can visualize the research life cycle as in the figure here that you start always with some kind of background information, some hypothesis that you want to uh, develop or demonstrate, uh, some assumptions, some input data, and then some methods, uh, do some experimentation, you get some results, and after some scientific interpretations, you get some conclusions, and then you get some publications on that. Of course, very important is the incremental loop that is uh, based on science. So science is based on this kind of incrementally uh, uh, increasing of, of the knowledge, basically. So of course, the knowledge is transferred through all the whole process, uh, contributions to the research community from the researchers doing the work, but also from the research community to the researchers when after, for example, doing some kind of review or after reading and getting this information, they would like to validate all of these claims that they are um, um, uh, pub publishing and so on. So this is a very incremental process. So the point here is how we can actually reuse uh, better the results from the previous research in order to do uh, increase in knowledge. So this is, uh, of course, as you know, uh, scientific publication has been always a very good uh, means to disseminate our, our results. But as it has been already um, pointed out by many different initiatives, the publication itself is not enough in many cases to allow the reuse and uh, revalidation of the results. And this is where we come to the concept of what we call the research objects. Please, next slide. <clears throat> so the research object is uh, basically trying to 
uh, account, describe and share everything about the research, including how things are connected to each other. And this is like one of the key technologies behind Reliance. Uh, and you can see this uh, research object is a kind of logical container. Uh, as you can see in, the, in this uh, figure, it's like a box. You can see like a logical container is as a box, which includes, first of all, an identifier, like a DOI, like you can use as well to cite, to uh, make some publication and cite your research object. Inside this uh, box, you also have information about the hypothesis, about the data, about the method that you use to produce and analyze the data and the workflows implementing those methods. Of course, what happens during the uh, execution of these methods you can also keep track of the whole research life cycle, so uh, keeping versions of what happened during this uh, life cycle, the people that was involved, and of course, very important annotations. That means information description, both in terms that are easily readable by the people, but also that are easily readable by machines about the resources that are encapsulated in the research object. So this is a very large initiative as well. This is coming even before this European Open Science Cloud started, um, we started from the very beginning with that, that it's almost like 2010, we started this initiative and there is a big group of people working on research objects at this moment. If you go next, please, uh, Davide. So why the research objects? So basically one of the main key points I can point you out very briefly here is they allow you to organize and describe the resources, the materials and the methods of an investigation. They allow you, of course, to share all of this material with other scientists at discrete milestones. And of course, you can uh, identify all of this uh, with a particular DOI or any other identifier. So it's, again, it's not now that you are publishing just publication, you're publishing everything about your research. That's the point. So this facilitates the reproducibility and the reuse of the methods this allows to be recognized and cited, even if you are not finalized, uh, you know, to the point of having a final publication, you can still already be recognized and cited during the process of making this, uh, uh, this research, basically. You can, of course, use research objects to preserve the results. And finally, uh, this, the research object will give the evidence for the findings that you are claiming in a scholarly communication, so like publications. Uh, go next, please, uh, Davide. So with that said, I briefly introduced the three services of Reliance. So the first one is uh, called the uh, research objects, which is the overarching mechanisms to manage the scientific research and activities. And the technology behind this is ROHub, this is a platform. Then we are also bringing in Reliance uh, technology based on data cubes. This is uh, very important for the scalable access to uh, Earth observation data. Uh, particularly, we're focused on Copernicus data, but this is basically coming from any kind of large data sets like Earth observation, uh, because we are dealing with Earth scientists a lot. Uh, and of course, the last one is about text mining that allows to extract machine readable metadata from the resources that are related to this investigation so that you can, of course, uh, uh, discover, improve the discovery of these resources, and of course, also to organize your research better. So with that said, I will now leave the floor to, to Anne uh, to give you a bit more practical overview on that. Yes, thank you, Raul. And uh, so I will share my screen. You want to stop sharing? I think you need to stop sharing before. And I will show you in practice um, how we work <coughs> with all the different services. Um, so let me maybe share first my screen. Um, and now you should see the ROHUB, and this is where we will start. So I'm a climate data scientist, so I, I know very well how to manage data, but I'm working with a very wide range of uh, researchers. Some of them don't have very high level technical skills, um, and I have master students, for instance, they are just starting, and I have PhDs. So this platform is also for me to um, to summarize and aggregate all the resources for all the different pro projects I have. So um, the first thing you need is to sign up to this world. And this is the first step I would uh, suggest anyone to start with. I have already uh, signed up, but when you sign up um, as a researcher, you probably, it's maybe a bit slow. I don't know. 
uh, I really suggest you use this logging with EGI checking, even if uh, uh, it looks weird and we don't really know at the beginning what that means. But mostly because um, as a researcher, we all have an ORCID identifier. And I always authenticate to any other services with an ORCID identifier. And if you don't have any ORCID identifier as a researcher, I really strongly suggest you register and get one. So this is really a, a way to identify yourself in any of the services. Um, of course, I have already one, so I don't really need. I can already log in. Uh, hopefully, it won't take too long. And I should be logged in in a few seconds. Uh, so this is quite e easy to register. And uh, uh, once you have access to this uh, reliance as yourself, you can first, you don't really need to uh, authenticate to browse the existing resources. But if you want to create your own, you need to be authenticated. Um, and here you have the explore um, tab where you can see all the different research objects that have been created by everyone. So there are many, many. Uh, and here you can search. So, for instance, uh, I usually like to search by types um, and uh, we have a bibliographic research object, which are mostly uh, publication or around publication, but it's not only scientific papers. So I use a lot of bibliographic research object to aggregate uh, resources from, uh, for instance, for videos and uh, uh, for uh, articles online that are not necessarily published as papers. Um, and otherwise, we have data centric research objects. This is really to search for data sets or uh, executable research objects, which are uh, mostly in Warhub Jupyter Notebook. Um, but I can show you from mine to show you what I do. So these are all the research objects I have created. So this is all for different projects I have. And in this here, editable research object, this is all research objects that have been created. Uh, from, uh, by my colleagues or by people I'm working with, but I, I can edit this uh, research object, which means I can also add resources and I can work with them. Um, and this is very important for collaboration because most of the time, um, so I can maybe take this one. This is the latest one we have created. Um, I'm working for the Nordic infrastructure collaboration. So I'm working with people uh, that are located um, on very uh, different locations. So um, I don't have many colleagues at the University of Oslo. Most of my colleagues are in Sweden, or in Finland, or in Iceland, or even all over the world. So here, for instance, uh, we are working with a colleague in, uh, in Fortaleza, Fortaleza in Brazil. Uh, and uh, what we would like to assess is uh, um, uh, understand uh, urban, urban heat island effect on uh, uh, very specific location area, which is Fortaleza, and see if it has changed over uh, the 20, uh, last 20 years. So what we want to understand is uh, if the changes in temperature over the surface um, during the night and the days uh, are smaller today than the, uh, 20 years ago, because uh, uh, it's uh, um, with the climate change, usually in, in big cities, um, we have more and more uh, higher temperature during the night compared during the day, so it's not cooling at night when normally it's supposed to, to cool. Uh, and it means uh, uh, for, uh, it ha can have an impact on the health of people, but also because they don't sleep very well and they can be more aggressive. So this is, for instance, in Fortaleza. They also want to link this to, um, like to crime and uh, um, if, see if there is any impact, any increase that can be correlated. This is very like the beginning. Um, and for this, we are using data, uh, which we need to be able to share. So this is the main point here. Uh, as you can see, I mean, this is not much. This is very new. So we have only one plot. Uh, we can put the location here, which is the area where we do this study. So this is Fortaleza. This is in Brazil. Um, and uh, if you want to work with people that are not in your lab, you need to be able to have a, a location where to say where data you are using and where they are. Uh, if you are using any software or any resources, you need to be able to share with them. 
Um, and if you have generated some plot on some data, you need to be able also to share with them. And we want to share with them now, uh, not uh, like in one week or in two weeks. So before what we were doing, we were sending a lot of emails uh, or we were uh, in Slack and we were uh, putting some data or exchanging uh, sometimes with, uh, with uh, soft uh, re software repository like GitHub. But now we have one place everything and this is super uh, much easier for us to work because most of the time i have like at least 10 different projects um i never know where the data is who has done what and when well now i have everything up to date so when i go here i know uh, some bibliography and this is uh, not me someone has found a nice paper probably uh, which is about, uh, uh, yeah, I need to log in from my university because it's probably behind. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, the same example. Uh, so this is the urban, urban environmental changes in South America, but this is an, uh, over another town, which is Rio de Janeiro, but this is probably very relevant for us. Uh, and uh, some people have already created some output. And uh, here we have a Jupyter notebook. So if I go on the tab here on the content, I can inspect a bit more. So I click here on the tool and I can really see all the different resources. Uh, so here, I, when I click, I can also see some metadata. So we always add some info more information. So I see here that someone uh, added the link to the render notebook. I think this is me, this one, because um, I'm the one doing this uh, uh, technical development. Uh, and when I click here, I can see the resource, uh, which is an example of a Jupyter notebook, which can be seen. So here I have all the resources, uh, and this is the development I have done. But now let's talk about the data. So here I need to access data, and I need to be able to run this uh, Jupyter notebook or as this software. And I don't want to do it on my laptop. Because if I do it on my laptop, I will have to tell uh, my colleagues what software I have used, how I have used it, and they will, uh, will iterate. I mean, this is what we used to do before. After maybe 10 days, we managed to have the same environment. And it's a lot of time wasted. And every time we need to uh, change something, it's even more time wasted. Well, now for executing this uh, uh, Jupyter notebook, which is uh, uh, something we are familiar with in my lab, uh, we are using uh, a, a service from EGI. So this is an EOS service, which you will have access from uh, Reliance. Uh, and when I access this Jupyter notebook, everyone working with me can access. So this person is working in, in Brazil, they can access it. Uh, and then when I run it, I can show you here, this is a typical Jupyter notebook environment. Uh, I think this is probably this Jupyter notebook here, which I have written, started to write, and I can execute. And when I will execute it, it will immediately uh, give the same results than the one I have in this here, which means my colleague can start looking at it uh, and can see what data I have already started to use. And the data we are using for this, we are using data which we don't want to have uh, locally on my laptop or somewhere that no one else can use. We are using data from this Adam platform, what Raoul mentioned. So this Adam platform here, this is also another service from the Reliance project where uh, you can browse over the entire globe and select different area and select different kind of data. So again, you need to log in here and you are uh, logging with the Rohab services. And here we have many, many data. And of course, we can add some more data. And the data are organized in what we call these data cubes. So we can access them from anywhere. Um, and we access them from the Jupyter notebook, but we can access them from different uh, software. Um, so here I'm logged in, and I can sponsor show you. Um, usually, so here we have many data sets. This is usually the data set I'm working on, but if I click on the plus, 
you can see uh, we have 125 data set available on the uh, Alarm platform. It's a lot. Uh, some of them are uh, covering different geographical areas. Usually what we suggest is uh, um, when you have like global data sets, so data sets that are covering the entire globe, like Copernicus data, we suggest you first select a geographical region where you want to have the data. So here you can create new geometry. Uh, for instance, here I can I don't know, make a new geographical area, and then you can select data. Uh, I don't know if I have already. Well, let's try to find some era five. I don't know if I can. Yeah, like this one. So this uh, era five land daily data. This is two meter temperature. Uh, and uh, this is yeah okay so you see already is this uh, the data is uh, covering only the region i have selected which is nice because uh, if you manage to narrow down to the region of interest you don't have to uh, like to stream or to download a large amount of data and of course you can choose the dates here i mean here this is um, 2021, but this is a data set that is covering a very uh, large period of time, so you can browse uh, and go to different days. Um, and you can also change if you want, uh, um, like the color map. Um, I use this tool here on the graphical interface, mostly to identify the region where I'm, I'm uh, interested in. Uh, and then usually I go back to uh, the Jupyter notebook once I know uh, the geometry. So I know approximately the data is available covering which region uh, and what data I want to access because here I have a, a lot of more information. I think if I click here about the data, I know this is uh, the name of the data set. Uh, I can go back here and I can select the geometry. So here uh, I selected a different region. I, selected the region over Brazil, um, and then I will get the data from, uh, from the Adam platform here, where I need to authenticate, so I need to uh, get the um, Adam API package, um, I need to access the products, um, and then I can select the date. So for now, uh, we are focusing on three years, 2004, 2005, and 2006. And we want to uh, make uh, uh, an analysis over uh, three, uh, four different months from February to May uh, and see if we have changes between the night and the uh, days. But later on, we will take a much longer time series. Uh, and uh, I can uh, only upload the data in this Jupyter notebook that corresponds to the, my area of interest. Um, and the data I have downloaded here locally for, for my analysis. So we are just starting here. Um, so I, I have made only one plot. I started this morning. But the data I have already uploaded, I put it in a shared repository, which is here, this data hub, which is also part of the EGI. Uh, and we have a Reliance folder, and it will be in this folder here. So very important, I organize very well my data so that everyone can access it and understand what it is about. And in the, in the Teams uh, tool, I will, uh, no, not this tool, I think in the output, I will put uh, um, some of the NetCDF data I have extracted from this. Uh, and uh, I think in the input, I will have all the data downloaded from the data cube which means my colleague now is uh, from Brazil. Um, it will start very soon because it's uh, just uh, the beginning of the day for them. Um, and there is a R user is not using Python, but uh, um, if you see here, you can also use R, but he will have already the data set and he can also start to uh, do some analysis. And he can also reuse my uh, Jupyter notebook if he wants. So we have everything up to date. Uh, everyone can start working. Um, and uh, that's it. What else should I mention here uh, in the overview? Uh, maybe this is not the best because it's a new one. Um, I can maybe take another example. So this one is what we call a live research object. It's uh, um, evolving. 
um, it has been created this morning, so there is no annotation uh, yet. The only keywords here is, uh, uh, are keywords I, I have added myself, but we can take another example, for instance, uh, this one, which is um, another work uh, I do. I have done it for uh, already as part of the Reliance, and we are trying to assess the impact of the COVID-19 lockdown on the air quality, but uh, uh, we do it over Europe. So I have done this uh, analysis a bit earlier, and the same, you see the organization. I have a bibliography folder, input, output, and I also have a tool. So uh, I know here I will expect to find, again, my Jupyter notebook and the render of Jupyter notebook, which is probably also online. So it's always the same organization, so it's easier for me to understand how it is organized. Uh, and uh, this one on the right hand side, it has a license because it can already be reused. It's a MIT license. I added a grant. It can already be cited and shared. Here, you see, I can share the link with everyone. And we have this additional section here. So this is a text mining, and this is the enrichment service uh, from the Reliance. So all the resources I have added here, um, after, uh, I don't know when you probably see it somewhere here. Uh, yeah, so you see here the service account enrichment. Um, on a regular basis, they will go through all the resources uh, from and the research object from Reliance, and they will enrich your research object automatically with some data, metadata that are discovered from all the resources you have added. So this is why it's extremely important to document and to add description of all your uh, all, all of your resources. And here, this is all the metadata that have been discovered, and uh, there are different type, uh, person, domain, um, and uh, etc. Places and concepts. Um, I think that's it for me. Did I forget anything? No. Okay. So I can stop sharing. And I'm done. <coughs> okay, fantastic. And thank you very much for this uh, ends on the on digital assets where, you know, Raul and team produced. And uh, so I don't know if uh, we have some questions after uh, this uh, first part of the presentation. And uh... okay, if there's no questions, I do have some questions. Yeah, please. So, so. I, so I have one for uh, well, I would say both Raúl and and Anne, but as I have more for Anne later, maybe for Raúl. And it's about the slide you showed where you had experiments in you know on the left, and then then my question is. Is this tool only for experimentalists? As you know, you know, ICTP is a theoretical physics center, so most of the research is theoretical. And I wonder how this tool would, you know, work for them to document the workflow in a way. Yeah, of course. Uh, no, definitely. <clears throat> uh, what I meant uh, on the slide is you can have any type of um, um, research artifact related to some particular work. So these can be, of course, uh, experiments in you know experimental science. It can be observations. Uh, can be anything that is uh, allowing you to to keep some organization related to your work. So of course uh, we have, uh, for example, the, the concept of research shop that has originally was applied and tested in experimental science in bioinformatics and astronomy. Uh, but now uh, during the last uh, five years or, or so, we have been. Uh, focusing a lot on earth sciences, which has been our uh, main set of communities that have been adopting uh, much and more the concept of research object. Uh, but overall, the concept itself is quite open. So you can put inside anything that is relevant for your particular case. So that's... Okay, in fact, I saw publications, for example, no? in, in Ant demo. Okay. <clears throat> and then... As we're waiting for more questions in the chat, one question for Anne is about a well. First of all, the relationship between these uh, main Arrow Hub and the Reliance 
project. So um, is it you know like a specific use of a Rohab that you're doing in Reliance? And so maybe if you can clarify that. And, and then the second one, what will happen once the project is over? Which I think is something that we all have in mind when we upload our data and our you know publications and our thoughts on some on some website. Okay, so to answer to your first question, uh, I don't make a, like a specific usage because it is reliance. And uh, for instance, uh, the, now we are working with some researcher in UK, and this is not in the framework of reliance. This is in the framework of other projects I'm part with. Um, and uh, for me, it's a, a, it will not stop by the end of the project. So all the research uh, object I have created will remain, but I will also continue to create new research object in the, in the whole hub. Um, because uh, now we are bringing uh, many researchers uh, and we are not bringing them to uh, hub, but all re the Reliance services for six months only. Yeah, I can also compliment a bit on, on that. Uh, um, so first of all, as, as uh, David also mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, so the, the, one of the main aspects of, is the sustainability of all of these services beyond the project. So Reliance is bringing, because the services existed before Reliance. Uh, so what we are doing in Reliance is putting them together, connecting with the rest of the ecosystem of EOS and living there as part of the EOS ecosystem in general. So um, the, the services will, after Reliance, continue to be there as part of the EOS ecosystem, which is a much bigger, much larger you know, initiative in Europe that will continue for the years to come. So that's with respect of, of, of the use on, on, on the services themselves. OK, we have a question for Anne, I guess, in the, in the chat. I say that one of the publication in the Rohab presentation to show has a quality rating of 60%. And so the question is, are there any parameter about the quality of publication on, on the Rohab? Actually, that's a good point because I forgot to show the quality because this is quite new feature. So I, maybe I can share my screen and show uh, the quality. Uh, okay, I cannot share my screen with someone else. Is okay yes thank you so if i i take the same one where we have 60 percent here i mean the quality here you have different type uh, tabs and one of them is quality uh, and the quality of your uh, research object is based on all the different uh, information you are, are supposed to add in your research object depending on the type of research object so this uh, research object is an executable research object and obviously, uh, I haven't added all the necessary information. Uh, so some of them are missing, like the one are here that are in red, of course, is, uh, is, means I, I should add um, a publisher, which I haven't added yet. Uh, and the research object doesn't have uh, uh, keywords uh, that I, I must add annotation. It's not annotated yet, so it needs to be added. Um, and then I think this one, uh, but uh, I think Raul, you can probably confirm this is not necessarily the mandatory one, but this is yeah. the one I sh should add if uh, I really want to be a very good, uh, really to have a very good research object. Yeah, indeed. So there are like three uh, categories like uh, of requirements. So there are the, the must requirements or the obligatory requirements. There are should requirements that are like recommended and there are like main requirements which are kind of optional let's say but would give a, an additional value uh, and these are just coming from the researcher this is not something that we created so the researchers like Anne and our other uh, colleagues in, in Reliance they told us what would be the best set of information or metadata uh, that the research objects should have in order to to be considered in good quality. So this is not uh, something that we came up with. This is from the communities. 
Yeah, so for us, this is important to have all these different uh, aspects here. And uh, the other one is to have a very well organized research object. So we also ask to have this um, organization so that when we go from one research object to another, we can go directly into the folder and find the resources. So we know bibliography will be in Biblio, uh, all the inputs will be in input, outputs in output, and all the tools will be and software will be in tools. So both with the quality, um, if we have a research object with low quality and not very well organized, it means uh, it's uh, decreased the usability. So as a researcher, this is really nice if we have guidance on how to improve the quality so that other can reuse uh, my research object so, and be cited. So I can stop sharing, sorry. <clears throat> All right, there's, an, there's no other questions, so maybe we can uh, introduce a bit what we are supposed to be a, a sort of a demonstration. We are the adopters, are the users. And, you know, <clears throat> the. Um, sorry, just a second, I'm fixing here. Okay, so uh, we have seen what the Reliance service can, can provide, uh, you know, researchers with. So uh, they are tools. They collect, organize, analyze information data on certain topics. But actually, if we don't have scientists to use them and all this digital um, ecosystem is pretty useless. So we need to, um, to have not just those that, like, uh, for instance, uh, scientists uh, like Anne and others that have uh, somehow uh, created a use case scenario for service validation. But we need also more than that. We need uptake. And, and the uptake is uh, what comes next. You know, we develop, somehow we, we, we co-design with Zurcher these uh, services, and now we have to grow the, the user community of the services. And this is part of the work we were doing uh, under this specific task, epistemic community engagement capacity building, in trying to get early adopters on board. And it's not just a question of an issue of reliance, it's also a question issue, an opportunity also for all the infra project projects I mentioned before. Then. So there's a lot of digital assets here that goes beyond the ROAP, Adam, and text mining, that there are other features that can be part of this exercise. Okay, so um, that doesn't change it. Stuck no, all right. Um, so what, uh, what the first thing that we're doing, uh, in order to achieve this goal? Um, but first of all, we realized that we already have some community of research center institute and university departments, they are somehow interested in what we have done so far, or the I would say macro area of interest the scientific interest we have, and and we are clustering now according to this um, very large, uh, I would say, issue areas like anthropic impacts on waters. So whoever have interest in this uh, also is already involved in other European project or they serve in Institute of Research Center. They have um, uh, some activities related to water pollution, uh, macroplastic, microplastic, micro contaminants of uh, chemical, biological, etc. They might have interest in joining this community, or those they have more factors on geohazard, human induced, only human induced hazards like uh, you know volcanoes, earthquake, landslides, and fires, and those others that might also climatologists. Have, we you know recall one of the example that Anne made about you know uh, the measurement, the gauging of different level of pollution in the atmosphere during the the very severe low down in 2020 that you know the worldwide became a sort of uh laboratory a real <laughs> living laboratory to check and test all this so-called anthropos so sort of a time you know, within which the the human activities decline uh, and how the ecosystem react to this so it's a very interesting laboratory for many researchers and scientists and we thought that to focalize mainly on this aspect and create uh, early adopters coming from different research institutions to be 
to, to you know uh, to converge on the study of research this through our alliance services but also um, having also other opportunities or options um, in the next following months while our cooperation with our else will threaten and go more in deep. Sorry. So the, the second thing is that after we're clustered and this work has been partially done already because we have a um, brainstorming seminar um, from December, January, as actually this is our last one brainstorming seminar. And what we, we will do next will be sort of kickoff meeting. So sort of a three party, two, three participatory seminars where we'll, this challenge, reliance challenge cooperation for the adopters will be kicked off uh, according to the cluster we will form up. And, and what we want to do, but basically, I don't think it's sufficient. We don't think it's sufficient just to know that this, oh, this is Rohab, works like this, this is other thing. But maybe what we can do, it can, we can create or co-generate or think about uh, a joint project or more joint project and, 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 and you know, somehow qualish researchers around a, a problem to solve or something to investigate upon. Um, and in doing this work, we will have, you know, one end, so-called the, the virtual lens toolkit and, and real tutorship. So the virtual lens to, toolkit is sort of online, introductory practical explanation. So the benefit of the user reliance and, 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 and the services then by, by, by selected researchers. Actually, there's Anne and, and the other two researchers, our uh, ladies researchers that they're going to introduce us this. So there are pills are making, and so and all this thing can be uh, ready available and uh, download and anytime by any users. On the other thing we're going to uh, build up is sort of more uh, always online and more detailed tutorials on how to make use of single reliance service. More or less like uh, what Anna uh, displays today, but in the more uh, sequences form and you know uh, made for really for early adopters. And then we have a real time web coach. And this all offer is a service offered by Reliance to the user community. And actually we organize uh, two or three uh, B-monitoring meetings. Uh, we are our early adopters. I'm trying to understand if there are problems we using Reliance services, if there are some things that we may fix in the research, or we can maybe adopt additional uh, users, additional researchers in our research. And, uh, and this is uh, something that will go on and on. And we also feature more or less a roadmap here. You can see through this infographic. So we'll kick off on 25th March. With the, with the first uh, Geoazer disaster risk management cluster of early adopters. And then we end with uh, and on the 27th April with the Anthropic Impact of Waters uh, kickoff. And then we will start the capacity building. And uh, right after, you know, uh, all this uh, virtual uh, system, our virtual package will be ready available on, online. So all our users will be told and, uh, and that they can all you know, use this, uh, this uh, common pool resources. And then we will end at the end of November because what we want to achieve at the end of the day is, or the end of the story, is that we would like to get uh, some tangible result, a story, a narrative of what was the uh, work in uh, open science and using these services and how to work and how this, uh, you know, a built up a collective endeavor. And uh, it's a sort of uh, storytelling on the, about the research that they conducted, main activities they conducted, the outcomes, and also final considerations. You know, what are the remarks and what is the added value using your related digital assets and also remarks to improve them. And that will give us a very important feedback, extraordinary feedback to maybe, uh, to conceive additional activities later on and to improve the services that we have uh, yeah, featured so far. And uh, although this is a very general idea because we, go, we have to go more in detail with our colleagues from the other uh, UX Future and Infraeoska uh, team. So there will not be just a standalone uh, event. It will be a sort of marathon of four days uh, within which we'll be able really to join, uh, you know, um, large number of users uh, to try different digital assets and to share the experience you know, with the, you know, within this, uh, uh, this venue. And I think that uh, we know, 
things are not really um, very well uh, defined at the moment because we're really working in progress. Uh, it's an experience for all of us, uh, but we have a lot of material, material that come from the, the start of validation. So we have a very important, uh, crucial, um, you know, investigations that have been already conducted by our researchers. So we have a, um, you know, important uh, subject that's already there, but maybe we can enlarge and we can deepen a bit more and uh, uh, also aggregating social human scientists in this, uh, in this work. Um, what well, the benefit for AV adopters are multiple. I mean, I just mentioned a few here. Uh, well, it's, it's everything, you, you know, it's a European, European Open Science Cloud that is open for everybody. And it's an opportunity for scientists also from, from poor countries for disadvantaged research infrastructures to be part of first class services, to advance their studies, cooperative in the disciplinary environment. And, you know, uh, everybody involved here gaining new valuable international experience to, to work in conducive interdisciplinary research environment. Uh, you get new skills. And, you know, as we say that, uh, you know, two, three times, and Martin also posed the question what to do next to the project. Actually, you have tools you may. Uh, user after the project is over and you can keep, uh, you know, this uh, community alive and you can keep growing your, uh, you know, your research all together. So um, this is in, you know, in a nutshell, what we are going to do in the next months. And uh, it will be a pleasure to have the opportunity also to, if you think that might fit also with your uh, work, with your mission, to find some entry points of cooperation. Very much uh, looking for it. And uh, so I will stay at your disposal. And in case uh, you, oh God, sorry. <laughs> so forget, uh, I have the last slide. And in case you, you want to contact that, so it's also my, um, second. Yeah, that's been uh, taken out, I'm sorry. I don't know why, but actually, um, I will write down in the chat. Okay, thank you very much. Davide and okay, okay, here is your email address if anyone wants to get in touch with you. Yeah. So there was one one additional comment, a question, in fact. Yes. I think for all, for Raul or, or, or Anne, and it's about downloading the data. So the, the question is, okay, once you, you know, uploaded all this data and at a certain point you want to, you know, download all your data for your, your kind of, you know, backup or personal mm -hmm. use, can you easily do that? Yeah, so I, I think I can, I can say a bit on that. So, <clears throat> uh, well, first of all, uh, as you saw in, in the Anne's uh, presentation, in the research object, you can have um, any type of resource, including resources that are stored elsewhere. So that means like you can, for example, have a data set that is in uh, your um, institutional repository or that is in some other place, as long as it is accessible, then of course it can be aggregated into the research object. Of course, you can also aggregate directly, upload physically data to the research object. But uh, let's say that that's not really like the main purpose of the research mm -hmm. object. The research object is main purpose is to collect, to, to be like uh, the, the web that connects all of the resources that might be spread in different locations. So, but going to, to in, in terms of uploading, yeah, it's possible. Uh, for now, we don't have a particular limitation uh but we haven't really foreseen situations where <laughs> we are talking about uh, hundreds of gigabytes of data for for one data set storing in the repository let's say i mean maybe i can add uh, that we have uh, several projects where we don't have the data for uh, in the adam platform for instance we have uh, uh, observation that we are from the meteorological station and we put them in uh, in this EGI notebook in the data hub, which is an EGI data hub, where we share the data with everyone in the, in the team, so we can work all together. 
and when uh, we will be ready for publishing, uh, we will uh, prepare, so the data will be prepared and organized already, and we will put this data into uh, the national data repository. But the advantage is normally we do it at the last minute. So when we publish, we panic because the publisher asks us to organize the data and we don't remember how to do it properly and it's a bit of a rush. But uh, so we publish something which is not necessarily very well um, defined and reusable. Well, now we will be super relaxed because everything has been organized before and uh, we only need to put what we have in the, the EGI data hub into our national repository with all the data and metadata. So it's much easier and we can see it already because we are preparing a, a paper with a PhD. Um, I'm a lot more relaxed because normally I have to check everything from the PhD students. So it, it helps a lot. Excellent. One more question from, from my side for uh, maybe Davide is about uh, scientific publications on 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 this project uh, has there been any publication done already so if someone wants to you know point to something that describes well in in, in terms of uh, what we're doing the capacity building as a science well so-called reliance challenge our goal is it's not really a full-fledged publication but it's more a you know exercise capacity building to to get creative sure. with the, you know with, the, with with digital assets with the services and uh, however, it does not exclude the fact that uh, by having this research or starting this investigation with others, they can, can could, for instance, take part of the material and then have um, a publication, let's say standard publications we know. And uh, may might be the case, I don't know, Anne, if uh, you know, we, we set out some, uh, some, uh, some researchers and then, um, you know, in the, la in the next few months, we may, find something interesting that can be the bulk for a new publication. I don't know if what you think of Raul and Anne about this. Yeah, <clears throat> so I mean, for sure, all of the, <clears throat> in, in the, in the first year, let's say some of the things that you can get from or as publications related to, to the project are uh, things connected to our uh, models, of course, uh, uh, that we are using behind. And uh, researchers like Ahane and you know our other communities are already in the process of making their own publication, but more more on their scenarios. Let's say so. If you are thinking of publications about the project itself, then you you, you could have, for example, things related to the research objects uh, models that we are using behind that kind of things. So there are there is some publications uh, related to that. I mean, on the scientific side, we are publishing paper as we would normally publish, but it's, uh, it's not on the project itself. It's uh, okay. taking advantage of the services sure. to speed up the process. Uh, but anyway, I, I will send you, uh, I will put it, uh, let me see, uh, in the name of one paper that describes uh, not uh, not all of uh, the latest advances, but uh, very much the idea behind all of these. Because as I mentioned uh, before, we have uh, uh, many of these uh, services were existing before the the, the reliance service uh, the, the reliance project started, right? So so uh, one of the main publication that is related uh, to this work, uh, I will put the, the title here on the. On the, it's a journal publication. I will put the title here on the chat. Um. Okay, and if someone is interested, then he can send an email to Davide yeah. or or to me or you know we. Yeah, sorry, I, I made a couple of. Uh, uh, mistakes and digiting, so it don't see very well. And there is an S at the end, so I'll comments. Okay. 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 okay, okay, thank you. Good, I think if there is no more questions, then thank you very much to Davide, Raul, Anne, and Manuel. It has been a pleasure having you.
in our seminar series on, <clears throat> on open science. And I hope some of our participants will get back to you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, everybody who shared. Thank you, everybody. Yes. I'm with um, us. We hope that uh, we can uh, get some uh, people involved from, from, from this particular initial collaboration with you. So that's that's our main target. Yeah. Actually, we're also thinking that would be quite interesting to have some UNESCO chairs that may also be uh, focused on these issue areas. But this is something that we can talk later on. Excellent. OK, then thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, bye. bye.